Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our first session of the day of our third day of the 2021 North Country Leadership Summit. Before I turn it over to our presenter, we wanted to give a quick thanks to all of our sponsors for this year's summit. Without their generous support, um, this summit would not be possible. So thank you to all of our sponsors. Some quick housekeeping items for everyone. Uh, please place any questions you have for Michelle in the chat box and we will ensure those are addressed during the Q&A session. All attendees, please remain muted with your video off during the presentation. And finally, this session and all presentations throughout the week are being recorded and will be archived on the North Country Leadership Summit website by the 1st of October. With that being said, I want to turn it over to our presenter, Michelle Hager of Blue Series Consulting, to give a presentation on protecting yourself from a telehealth audit. Take it away, Michelle. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you to the NCTRC team, the North Country team. We are, I am very um, honored to present today. So this presentation, uh, Suit Up, Protect Yourself in a Telehealth Audit, was um, developed and actually delivered once by uh, Christy Messer, who's on the line with us, as well as Amanda Bornicor from, North Country, uh, from Northwell Health. Um, so Christy is on the line, so she can answer some other questions, but um, we're going to go through the content. But if you do want to go through it again, as they mentioned, this presentation will be recorded and on the North Country uh, website um, by October. And then also uh, that previous recording that I mentioned is actually already on our uh, website. So it's not me doing the presentation, it's Christy and Amanda from Northwell. Um, so that's my bio, that's me, um, but that was back when I had color in my hair, so this is the actual me now. <laughs> Hopefully that was funny to the audience that's out there. So that being said, the objectives of the presentation are to kind of go through the evolution of telehealth that's happened since February of 2020. We know that there was sort of an explosion, this, you know, obviously the COVID stuff that happened until present. And we're going to review the OIG work plan for telehealth services. We're going to review some general telehealth documentation principles. Um, we want to make sure that you have strengthened your understanding of how the telehealth exam documentation has to be completed. Um, and then dive into some details around audio visits, e-visits, and remote patient monitoring, because that can be a little bit um, challenging and sticky when we talk about each of those types of uh, telehealth options. And we're going to also discuss the importance of medical necessity. How do you make sure that you're documenting correctly for medical necessity? What is important? What isn't important, et cetera. So we're going to try to go through the full gamut, but please feel free to put questions in the chat. Uh, we will... Um, link things that are relevant that we talk about, um, that we are, uh, you know, discussing that there's not in the presentation, and we'll also make sure that we answer all questions that come through the chat. So we've all lived this the last year and a half, but essentially pre-March, we had limited telehealth care delivery and special use cases only. Um, and we know we had limited overall adoption of telehealth. But then in March and January of 2021, all the way through January of 2021, we've sort of had this anything goes approach um, for the waivers, right? Which makes sense because everybody wanted to be able to be safe. And now that we're doing a surge, we're sort of in that same scenario where we're seeing um, outpatient visits being canceled. We need to see, uh, you know, hospitals are overflowing. So how do we address that? How do we use telehealth to be able to not only keep our physicians and patients safe, but also do effective care? So one of the things I talk about often around the use of telehealth post COVID and even in COVID is you look at um, why you're doing telehealth. And it's not just this replacement for a visit to keep everybody safe. Because when we go back to the stage where we have uh, no 
COVID, and we'll get there eventually, um, once we get to that stage, we don't want for our clinicians to not understand that telehealth is part of the continuum of care. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but I just wanted to put that in your head. It's part of the continuum of care. It's part of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis or what your clinicians do on a day-to-day -day basis to be able to um, effectively care for their patients, regardless of whether or not we're in a public health emergency or not. And then finally, January 2021 forward, we were navigating kind of a new normal. And then we see that the audits are coming back. So Joint Commission, um, CMS, OIG, they're all kind of looking at, you know, what do we do with, um, with telehealth? We need to do something because quite a bit of the uh, services are being developed or delivered, excuse me, via, tel via telehealth. So in the OIG, they announced the governance and the audits themselves. So in January 2021, they defined that they would have audits of Medicare Part B telehealth services during the public health emergency. There's phase one and phase two. And during phase one, those audits will focus generally on the early assessment of whether the ENM and opioid um, disorder and stage renal, et cetera, whether they meet the Medicare requirements. But in phase two, they're also going to look at Part B services related to distant and originating site locations. Part of why they're doing that is you, you probably have recognized this. They're doing um, kind of pilot programs that are happening you know, across. So they, they really want in some ways to look at what people are doing, but then obviously they're looking for um, whether or not people are being compliant as well. So this is looking at annual well visits to determine whether or not those Medicare requirements are being met. I can tell you that a story that in South Carolina, for example, OIG came in early in the process and audited the claims in, in the OIG, in the state of South Carolina, particularly behavioral health services and the, uh, the claims that were generated from behavioral health and the Department of Health, uh, Department of um, uh, DHS, the so Department of Health and Human Services, was not immune to it. They provide most of the uh, telebehavioral health services in the state of South Carolina. And as a result, when they did their audit, they found that they were non-compliant in the way that they documented their claims. In particular, and this is a point I think that's important for everyone to be aware of, in particular, it is because their policies defined that they had a start and stop time for a behavioral health visit. That was not required for an inpatient visit, for an in-person visit, but they made it a requirement in their policies for a behavioral health visit. As a result, the OIG said, you're not meeting the requirements that you have set forth in your policies. And this is not a compliant, um, these are not compliant visit visits. And there was a take back uh, for that uh, for that service, so quite a quite a bit in the, in the millions um, of dollars. So my comment to you is to make sure that your policies and procedures are also consistent across what you're actually doing for that service. Uh, so we'll talk more about that in a little bit, but keep that as a, a little check mark there in your head that you need to make sure your policies and procedures for telehealth are consistent what is, with what is actually being done uh, in, in practicality. And then from a general health, um, telehealth documentation, what stays the same? So for, um, for a general uh, statement around that, the medical record has to be complete, obviously, and legible documentation of each patient encounter, standard um, elements here, the reason, the relevance for uh, the, the visit, assessments, clinical impressions, diagnosis, medical plans, and the date and legible identifier, um, legible identity of the observer. So these are standard requirements that are already there for an in-person visit, and those continue to be the requirements for a telehealth visit. There aren't more requirements for telehealth, but there are at least the same requirements um, that you see from an in-person visit. So just kind of always keep that in your mind calculating whether or not you are meeting an in-person visit requirement that you would typically see. When you look at the telehealth documentation, where is their difference? Um, so there are these additional documentation pieces to consider is the consent, whether that is written or verbal, where's the location of the patient, obviously, uh, whether or not they're home or they're in another facility, 
um, the location of the credential and provider, and then the right to terminate telehealth and request alternate care, alternative care. So the patient has the right to do that. If they don't feel like the visit is going well, they have the right to do that. And you need to make sure that you're documenting um, that that happened if the, the patient decided that they wanted to do something different. And then uh, the platform that you're being that is being used um, to conduct the service. Is it a secure platform or not? And Christy, I'm going to stop there and ask if you have anything to add on that. Just trying to find the mute button real uh, there. I think this, this is all great information. And I just want to reiterate what Michelle said is that um, there's really, you know, the any additional requirements would be just to talk about that it was done via telemedicine. Um, you know, the location, who you are, and uh, the platform. So just really focus on the fact that you do still have to follow those in-person standard, uh, standard documentation guidelines. Right, exactly. Thanks, Christy. So let's talk a little bit about the telehealth exam. So um, when we look at clinical practices related to what we do with, a, with the telehealth exam, obviously from a preparation perspective, explanation with um, for the um, docu for the documentation of the visit, and then any escalation that needs to occur. From a preparation perspective, we look at the standards, practices, and procedures um, that physicians directed the patient performs a self exam. So, for example. Um, you can see when we talk about the policies and procedures that you have something in your standards that show you directed the patient to do a self exam. Um, you're not able to touch the patient obviously through uh, a, a video visit of any kind. So how do you have that happen? And you did a self exam. This is important for you to have in your policies and procedures. And I always talk about some of these things being protocolized. It's important that things aren't just um, sort of wild west inside your organization that, okay, they're just using this as a replacement for an in-person visit. So we don't necessarily have to go through all the documentation that we have to do for an in-person visit. Well, you know that telehealth is gonna continue to stay in some form or fashion some data suggests that it's up to 25%, 30% of your visits um, can be done via telehealth. So it's happening in some form or fashion. You need to make sure that you have some protocols associated with that. And you do that just like you would with your in with your in-person visit. What is your standards? When do they use this telehealth? And um, how is it done? How is it documented? So everything is in a standard. So it doesn't become physician specific and non-consistent across your organization. Even if your organization is small, as long as you keep it consistent, you're pretty much standing in the audit proof scenario and you've got policies and procedures to back you up. Um, so create a list of items in the patient's at home toolkit um, and share that prior to the visit. So if the patient has a stethoscope um, on board or they have an AFib um, checker or even a smart watch, um, making sure that you share that, um, you know, information prior to the visit and that, that we know that the patient has um, that information. So we can utilize that as part of the self exam. Under the explanation side, documentation should always match the modality that was utilized. So make sure that you add the necessary narrative and identify that these were the hands-on elements and how they were obtained. So that could be, I got the blood pressure that was on an Apple Watch, or I got the blood pressure that was on their personal blood pressure cup, for example. Um, I got their glucose monitoring. It was on you know, their, their own glucose monitor at home. And then from an escalation perspective, if, the di if diagnosis are required, have a plan to terminate the visit and then send the patient prior to the visit or deploying any particular devices that you might need to for that visit in case of an emergency, have an es escalation plan. So this is one of the things that we talk about in detail quite a bit. And that's if you do have to terminate the visit for any reason, but let's talk about it being in an emergency, that you again have some policy and procedures around what do you do if there is an emergency when you're on the phone or on a virtual visit with someone. If that happens, 
how are you going to call 911? I think many people have had this conversation. You know that if you call 911 where you are, it's not going to make it to where the patient is necessarily. So understanding maybe you have a service or maybe you have a, a cheat sheet that shows you where your 911 calls are, or maybe you call a central number. Uh, that's one thing to have at your fingertips to be able to manage for an emergency with the patient. And then if they do have to just terminate the visit because it's just not working and you need to have them come in person, um, then what is, what is it that um, you're going to document at that time? You had to terminate the telehealth visit because you had to do diagnostics and the patient wasn't able to do a self-exam, for example. Uh, from strengthening your telehealth documentation, some of the potholes that we find um, happen within um, an organization um, and can happen when you're doing some of this documentation out there. And, and that is, um, you know, looking at some of the EMA, uh, electronic medical record and guided examination templates. So some of the things that can happen is everything's um, so preference sheet driven that it doesn't necessarily match with the telehealth visit. So watch what you have in terms of templates inside of your EHR and that you're gathering the next necessary um, information related to that EHR. So for example, if you needed to demonstrate that um, you did a range of motion based on the complexity of the visit, how did you do that? And if that's, there's not a spot for that in the medical record to be able to put that information in, then make sure that you work with your IT department to be able to put that information into your medical record. I can tell you this idea of having a complex visit. In other words, you've got something complex happening like a range of motion or like you watch their gait. Um, what we're finding is some of the payers, not just Medicare, but other commercial payers are questioning that you have a complex visit coded, but how did you do that complex visit? And was it appropriate for the code that you um, identified and for the patient's condition? So making sure you have more documentation around that is even more important. Um, the copy forward of use of macros, same kind of thing. If you've got something that's kind of just automatically happening, make sure that that is um, appropriate and there is some um, intervention, intervention from the clinician. And then in 2021, um, the E&M guideline changes. So <clears throat> for example, you didn't have to um, Christy is an expert on this space, so I'll ask her to add some information on this. But for example, you, you need to make sure you don't have to have all the details around um, the H and P's, and you didn't have to have you know bunches and bunches of um, bullets and checking every single organ for the patient, you know, an A organ system check or whatever. Then um, you no longer have to have that. So there are some changes that make it a little bit easier for your clinicians. Um, in order to be able to, um, to build that code. One of the things that I know Christy talks a lot about is the idea of time, making sure that time is defined in the documentation. If time's not there, that's usually, it's, it's all about the time and the type of exam that you did. And Christy, what do you have to add to there? Yeah, absolutely. So 2021, um, you know, brought some great changes with the ENM codes. And one of them is that uh, now you, you don't have to document a prescribed history in an exam, but you do need to consider what you did and it needs to be relevant to the clinic, uh, to the medical decision making uh, complexity of the visit. So uh, it, it is clinically driven now, um, but there's no bullet points that you have to, to meet. Um, and then really the choice of codes is now based off of that medical decision-making and or time uh, medical decision-making is preference, but you, you now always wanna have that time uh, documented and that's gonna go for your in-person and telehealth. So that's one thing you don't have to remember for either or you can just do it for both. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, so these are some of the details that we talked about just a moment ago and avoiding potholes to show your work, documentation of support, the modality that you're utilizing. So again, making sure it's, it's defining a complex visit if, if you are doing a complex visit, um, some of the hands-on elements um, to support the narrative and all the copied notes or macros that you might have built into your 
EM, EMR, just kind of spot check those on a regular basis, just to make sure that um, the system systematic elements that you have defined into a documentation aren't actually doing you harm. And then the HMP that we just talked about. So let's dive into the audio visits, e-visits, and remote patient monitoring. So now we have virtual check-ins, which were pre-pandemic as well. So for those of you that are not using a virtual check-in, you need to use a virtual check-in. It's a great tool in your toolbox. In addition, um, making sure that your virtual check-ins are um, appropriate. But one of the things that um, CMS talked about was the fact that virtual check-ins were not being utilized. And they said, we've got this code out there. Why are you not utilizing it? Why are you not utilizing it? We don't need to do any more telehealth codes. You're not using the ones that we have. So make sure that you're utilizing a, a virtual check-in. You can see the codes that are listed there, um, decodes and um, those that are for an RHC or FQHC. Um, in addition, the, te the telephone e &M codes, those are allowed by most carriers, as you can see there, and, and payers are considering permanently putting uh, those telephone codes out there. And we see that now that uh, several of the payers, including CMS, are really looking at audio only being um, a code that can be utilized. I think they're recognizing that it happens and connectivity can be a challenge. Um, so we're putting audio codes out there, but again, making sure that you're documenting. So if you had to watch the gate or you had to watch somebody do a self-exam or identify, you know, a range of mo motion, that's not the type of visit that you can code when you're doing a telephone only um, management code. And then those that are um, billed as parity to the EM EM codes, um, those are allowed during the pandemic by some payers, but we have a strong perspective that those are unlikely to continue post pandemic. Some of those um, telephone codes will, will go away and some will be changed into different types of visits. Um, one of the things that um, we talk about is, you know, informing um, the patient of um, you know, some of their rights associated with the visit, et cetera. It's not, doesn't preclude you from, um, uh, from, from doing that as well. So if you have an in inability to, excuse me, if you have an inability to, um, to communicate with the patient via telephone versus video, um, you just have to watch out for that. Maybe start to cycle um, a little bit more onto a video visit as much as you possibly can. And there's some strategies around improving your community um, technology as well. Um, so from the virtual check-in E&M codes um, as well, document consent, obviously this is uh, patient initiated um, and they verbally agree to the service. This could be anything from you leave this, the office and based on your protocol again, you have, um, you know, we have the opportunity to do a telehealth in seven days or eight days, telehealth visit as a virtual check-in for your um, for your medication follow-up. Is the patient does the patient want to do that? Yes. So that they've verbally agreed to that service, and you just have to document that. That's that's all you need to do in order to be able to do that. We there's oftentimes we look at pediatric patients who turn into no-shows because they don't come back for medication follow-up. So um, that's a good way to use a virtual check-in a, a little bit over seven days because we do have that seven-day requirement. I know you all can read this slide, so I won't go through every single um, point here, uh, but I wanna make sure that timing um, is important with the virtual check-in, it has to be past seven days and um, it should not re return a patient coming to the office within 24 hours. Um, or the next, you know, um, urgent appointment. So they essentially don't want you to bill a virtual check-in and then do a face-to-face -face visit. So it really is about answering questions that come up um, after seven days or to do that um, medication follow-up that I mentioned. Anything to add on that, Christy? Um, I think that, you know, a lot of these things are implied. It, you know, it says document through here, but just make sure that things are implied. So if your medical record can show that there is a provider patient relationship, um, you don't necessarily have to document that, but these are, these are best practices. So either document or that it's easily implied and uh, verifiable through your, uh, through your record. Right. That's required in your state. 
e-visits. Um, e-visits, obviously, non-face-to-face patient-initiated communications with the physicians. There's the CPT codes there for, um, for the charge itself. And this is a message exchange in the portal. So this is where you're doing that secure texting with the physician. You're probably not even billing some of this stuff now. So you can do that in an e-visit. Um, anything that's done through the portal, through secure text messaging, um, anything like that. Um, if it's um, if you're not indicated in the exchange, patient provider relationship must be documented. Um, essentially, this is what we just talked about from the patient provider relationship initiating uh, that relationship. If someone is um, doing secure texting or whatever, or sending you a picture, um, if your state requires you to be, have a provider relationship or patient relationship prior to billing. It cannot be reported at the same day as an e &M service. So you can't do a secure text, even though, you know, let's say they went to a visit earlier that day and then they said, hey, doc, I forgot. What did you say about how to take my medication? So that's not an e-visit uh, billable service. But if they did come back and say, I have, um, you know, a couple of days later or a day later, even outside of that 24 hours um, time is, did they come back and say, I have a rash or I have a reaction, I have a sore throat or I have a closed throat. Those are the kinds of things that you can do and, and patients can do that um, and you can charge for that e-visit. Um, and then check with the patient portal or EHR vendor for templates and modules for that service because almost all of the portals do have some kind of secure messaging associated with that. Michelle, I just want to uh, jump in there. I, I can't stress enough um, really look into your EHR vendor or your EHR vendor community to see what others are doing because the workflow around this uh, can be tricky to operationalize and, and you really want to make sure that, that you um, don't reinvent the wheel and, and use tools that you, you have accessible to you. Yep, good point. You don't have to buy something new to do that. Usually they're already in, in, your, um, in your EHR. On the remote patient monitoring side, um, documenting the medical necessity for the monitoring is very important. This is true of, of anything that we've talked about, medical necessity being important, but particularly with remote patient monitoring. Um, and then also it has to be a minimum of 16 days outside of um, the PHE. So, um, patient consent to be monitored and um, the provider patient relationship has to be documented. So we have to make sure like everything else that we've done before that we get consent from the patient to do a remote patient monitoring. Then we do document that there's a patient provider relationship in there. Do have to document what your device brand model is um, and it has to meet the FDA definition of a medical device. So sometimes people will say, oh, it's I've got my Apple Watch is doing my blood pressure, is doing my pulse, and that's not defined as a medical device. It has to be an actual FDA um, definition of a, of a medical device, a certified medical device. And then one of the tricky things with RPM is monitoring uh, multiple parameters with separate devices could only be reported once per provider per 30 days. So this is the tough part. You don't necessarily know if someone else is monitoring that patient. And you need to ask the patient, do you already have a monitoring device in your home? Um, because if someone else is monitoring them and is already reporting um, data related to CHF or um, diabetes or weight gain or whatever, then um, you may not be able to do that at all um, if they're already reporting that and, and billing that within um, that 30 day period, then they've already captured that charge. Makes it a little tricky. You do have some specific codes that you can utilize though for the remote patient monitoring on documentation. So set up an education. That's really important because up till now we really didn't have any charge. Someone might say, well, that's not very much money. No, it isn't, but it's better than zero, right? And you probably weren't getting anything before that. Um, the collection of the data and programming, so any of the flow sheet data that you're collecting over a 30-day time period, you can actually bill for that. The care team communication uh, with your caregiver or the patient, 
during that calendar month. And you can utilize your flow sheet documentation um, for the care team to include the time and accumulate that time throughout each month. So these are areas where you can bill. So there are individual charges that you can utilize with remote patient monitoring as well. Um, in addition, there are some self-reported at the bottom. You can see there for self-reported blood pressure and continuous glucose monitoring. You have to use the more specific CPT codes for those that were self-reported, they kept a log or et cetera. Um, so keep that in mind um, that you've got those self-reported ones as well. And, and previously I missed the one just before it, but you can see that there's some expectation from our team that we don't expect um, that, that you wouldn't expect that um, those codes would be billed simultaneously on a regular basis, those individual codes that are defined there. So let's talk a little bit about medical necessity. Before I jump into medical necessity, did you have anything, Christy, on that? No, no, I think you did okay. a great job. Okay, great. She's going to keep me honest too. Um, so from um, a delivery of service, element here. Um, services that are developed, delivered by a telehealth um, have to be reasonable um, utilization management, quality assurance are consistent to those that are established with the same service if it's not delivered by telehealth. So oftentimes when you're talking about telehealth, people will say, well, you need to make sure that it's you know, even better than what the in-person in visit would have been. And, and that's not the case. We don't need to have more requirements for telehealth, more standard. Um, the bar doesn't have to be higher in terms of the clinical service that you're doing or the quality of the service that you're doing it just needs to be the same. Were you able to talk to that person? Were you able to evaluate them? Were you able to do that self-exam? So when you look at medical necessity, it still matters. So the modality should be used as an equal alternative to an in-person service. So what was the modality that you utilized? I did a virtual visit. So that's equal to the in-person service. Um, the utilization of the modality alone doesn't make that service reimbursable. So not just the fact that they had that available makes that a reimbursable service. Medical necessity matters. And it can't just be that they now have access to care or that they are now accessible to care. That's not the same as reasonable and necessary. So it's so you're not over utilizing telehealth as a as a backstop. So it still has to be the same reasons that you would do an in-person visit. We're not doing anything more, but we're not doing anything less as well. Some of the key takeaways for each of these services um, from a parity of um, telehealth services, you've got documentation guidelines for the code. Those remain the same. Um, and you have to include, obviously, some scripts, prompts, capture key components, specific uh, telehealth modality for those individuals. So some states and some individual payers do pay parity of service. The documentation guide guidelines are the same um, regardless. For an audio-only visit, we do have, um, during the PHG, there have been multiple ways to report an audio only, but we know that tell audio only, we're trying to see where we can do that in certain cases, as I mentioned earlier, uh, but some in some cases, the virtual visit, the video visit is going to be, um, you know, king in, in that way, and you'll get certainly more payment for that. Make sure that you do have these protocolized approaches. This can be an audio visit, this cannot. So if someone can do a video visit, but they have to backstop to an audio, they know right away based on the, the protocol that they have to cycle back to an in-person visit. It's not just their choice. Oh, I'm just going to do a phone call now for convenience. Um, we want to make sure that we're documenting that correctly and we're doing the right level of care. Just the modality itself isn't enough, as I mentioned in the medical necessity um, slide. Payers may reimburse virtual checking codes or telephone EMMs. You got to look at each payer. And I can tell you that a lot of our clients are doing um, spreadsheets and they're updating them every single week and putting them on some kind of a share file or they're handing them out to everybody every week to identify what is changing with each of those payers. So it really is very volatile. It's something that you need to um, make sure that you have uh, documentation for your staff um, in terms of some kind of a spreadsheet so they know what they need to do. Uh, with an e-visit, 
that um, portal message exchange, you can use that as documentation. So you don't need to create something new in your EMR, just take that actual portal message that you had with the patient where they asked the question and you responded and that's your documentation. So you don't have to create brand new documentation models. Um, you've got something right there. Um, time-based codes, um, including the cumulative time spent over that seven days um, with that patient. So remember, um, we've got that um, seven day time time code. Time-based codes are important for everything. It's time and exam. So making sure that you've got uh, the time documented, as I mentioned, that issue with behavioral health, they particularly made a, a value or a, um, a requirement that wasn't there for an inpatient visit. So it wasn't required to document time, how much time you had spent with a particular patient for a behavioral health visit in that South Carolina example that I mentioned on the OIG, but they put it in their policy and procedure because they just did a copy and paste of different policies. So don't do that. Make sure that each of your policies are correct and they are identified um, across the organization. Leverage your portal um, and utilize your EHR vendors um, workflows and templates so that each service has its own workflow and prompts clinicians. It's hard to remember all these nuances, especially with telehealth. So making sure that, that your um, EHR is actually working for you. Remote patient monitoring. We know that we've got general code um, documentation and code specific documentation. Keep that in mind uh, just because of all that, those codes that I just mentioned um, on the previous slide, multiple components um, over different time periods. So make sure you're leveraging your EHR. It's too confusing sometimes to look at all of those different components and manage. This will help you to manage your documentation. And those guidelines are evolving, especially with RPM. This is really a, um, RPM is really a, a, a pilot for CMS, essentially. And I always call it a way that CMS is tricking itself. So because RPM remote patient monitoring is not is defined as telehealth, they actually pulled it out. We should probably call it remote physiological monitoring on this on this slide because they pulled it out and named it different and said it's remote physiological monitoring. So guess what? It's not to telehealth, so it's not subject to the telehealth requirements that we have in the Medicare code. So they're kind of tricking themselves a little bit. You can see they're working really, really hard to try to pay for telehealth and uh, in some form or fashion, and they're doing that with across a, several different modalities, that being one of them kind of tricking themselves, and then also some of these pilots that we see kind of coming through, we'll pay for this, but not for that. We're trying to see how to utilize it. There's actually a big uh, program that's being done by the Center for Telehealth Policy and e-law that is capturing data related to telehealth. So they're always looking for data. So if you're interested in sharing um, some of your data with uh, CTEL, they are doing a data um, project with CMS and with HHS, and they are evaluating all the data that's coming in from all the different um, all the different uh, organizations across the country and seeing where telehealth is being utilized the most. What's been interesting kind of as a um, preview to that data is behavioral health, just how often behavioral health has been utilized uh, by telehealth. It's obviously very um, user-friendly to use telehealth. It's also patient-friendly. Patients are more comfortable, maybe more open when they're in their home environment. Psychiatrists, psychologists, and, and um, social workers are able to maybe see the patient in their own environment. And the ability to be able to, um, to do that visit at home uh, makes it more likely that they will actually come to the visit versus um, having it be in the office. There's a lot of stigma associated with that, especially if you have teenagers. We have a lot of behavioral health issue now with teenagers um, because of the school issues that we've seen over the last year or so. And if they have to go into a psychiatric center or some kind of behavioral health center, most teenagers think everyone's looking at them all the time. So they think that someone's looking at them going into that building, they're less likely to go. So doing it via telehealth, much more um, easy, stress-free and also kind of avoids the, the white coat kind of syndromes that we see with some other um, services as well. So I digress, but just an interesting story related to how CMS is looking at uh, some of these um, important initiatives related to data 
and um, also how other people are utilizing telehealth. Um, what seems to be that's true if you also look at the fair health data as well for claims across the country. Behavioral health um, codes are the top three um, are behavioral health codes. Anything to add to that, Christy? No, I think you covered it very comprehensively. Thank you, didn't pay her to say that. So brief history of uh, telehealth, kind of in the past, we had all these originating site restrictions. We had restrictions for allowable services to home. Um, we had a lot of direct to consumer stuff, but that's really low acuity, acuity didn't, you know, it's all non-complex care. Uh, you know, easy sniffles, et cetera, which is not the stuff that, you know, is really co contributing to the cost of care. What's interesting is that with originating site restrictions over and over and over again, I'm kind of a policy junkie. So over and over and over again, when I go to congressional updates um, and I'm, you know, in the CMS updates or, or others that I see across the country and, and looking at public policy, that particular uh, restriction is the one that is bipartisan. So we know that they're trying to get rid of the originating site restriction as well as the geographic site restriction. So that in the present time is eliminated during the waivers, of course, and we've expanded services to allow to home and we've got some regulatory requirements that were kind of broadened associated with um, controlled substances, et cetera, among other things. But they are definitely trying to target for that geographic site restriction, avoiding that originating site, distance site kind of stuff. I would expect that we'll see a flurry of legislation in December. So keep your eyes peeled on that. Um, you know, don't place bets based on, on, uh, on my statements. But if, if it's me, I'm placing a bet on that. We know that there's always a lot of flurry of legislation at the beginning of, at the end of the year, uh, before the beginning of the cal next calendar year. And uh, I think that's what we're gonna see. Once we see the pressure um, past the budget uh, that we're gonna see this um, geographic site restriction removed. So why is that relevant? Um, the PHE accelerated the need to perform those services. We need to make sure that that all people can provide these services. Everyone recognizes that kind of restricting rural providers from providing telehealth is uh, kind of crazy. They're also physicians, they're also nurse practitioners, physician assistants, nurses, et cetera. There's no reason why they shouldn't be able to provide that care at a distance if they have the skills to be able to do that. We know that um, proposals for future reg regulation still have some challenge for appropriateness of services to home. So home is still kind of that holy grail, especially, as, as, except for behavioral health. That's the only place where that seems to be, you know, not a problem. Everyone from a legislative perspective is really letting that go um, and understands that doing those services at home make complete sense. But when we start to do other things like the range of motion, like we're doing remote patient market, it's a little bit tough where we're seeing services as home as a place of service, that one, we'll just have to see what happens with that. I think that's gonna take data to demonstrate that we can do it just as well or better when we're doing it at home. It's kind of interesting because across the world, lots of people do services at home, but we don't. So that's just a cultural um, change that we have to make um, in our legislators to help them understand. Um, so post PAG regulations, they're still being formulated. As we said, this is really, really dynamic. They're changing every single day. Um, there's always people on the, on the hills of all states and all federal um, legislators asking them and talking to them about telehealth. Um, the good news is this isn't, um, healthcare is usually a, you know, a, 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 a political hot potato, but telehealth is not. It's very bipartisan. And so no matter who you're talking to in your state, uh, pretty much they're, they're going for, and they understand why telehealth is important. Anything to add to that, Christy? You know, I, I think really just from summing it up, Michelle, that telehealth, it's, there's so many rules and regs that when you start to go through them, you just end with the thought it's complicated, but as you break it down, um, it, it can be accomplished. And I think we're gonna see some, um, a little, Bit of bumpiness as we go forward as things get fleshed out but please don't stop doing telehealth we encourage you to continue with telehealth they need the data they need to see that we're doing the services and also any opportunities you have to speak with um, 
your county, state, federal representatives. Um, please help them understand, um, and even payers. I think they have an open ear right now and, and they need to hear from us. Yeah, really good, um, important advice to advocate um, on behalf of your organization and yourself and your family. Um, it's an important element. Um, I did see in the chat while you were talking that someone asked you if we have access to the recording. And I believe that um, Nancy said earlier that they would have this up on the website um, starting in October, at the first part of October. So we will have that um, available to us. So um, when we look at documentation and considerations for the future, uh, we talked a little bit about this, but past and present originating site restrictions are being reevaluated. Uh, we know that um, the federal, federal allowable list, service list is gonna be reduced and, and revert if, that, if the legislation does not change. Um, we do see, see, as I said, there'll be a flurry in, in December, but we'll see how those all, all that shakes out. Um, adjustments to regulatory requirements will be made. We know that's happening state by state. We know that's happening at the federal level as well. Um, individual states have parity. Other states have particular documentation requirements and particular provider type requirements for billing services. So make sure that you know what your state um, requirements are. And one of the things that we do that I think is important for you to be aware of is we not only look at what the payer requires, but we also look at the scope of practice law. So in some states, and I know, for example, Massachusetts has a requirement for this. Um, there's a couple of others that do as well. And I'm not sure if New York has this requirement as well, but there is a requirement for an education session um, a specific education that requires you to take that education and get sort of certified or complete it, completion in order to be able to do telehealth. So that's in the reg. That's not that's in the scope of practice, not in the payer requirements. So that's you know important to think about. So your state, for example, might be silent on the regulation um, itself, it says, you know, doesn't say anything about a provider type for telehealth, but when you look at the scope of practice, you can see that an individual provider type is required in order to be able to do telehealth. They can do telehealth and, and another provider type cannot. Um, we know that the data and clinical use cases are established and derived from the PHG will be significant, important to future, will provide significance and importance to the future allowances. So that data that I talked about and sharing that data with CTEL and other organizations that are collecting data to be able to um, uh, show and demonstrate. Unfortunately, it, it always drives me crazy. CMS always asks for data related, to, HHS always asks for data related to claims with CMS. I'm like, you are the same people. <laughs> Talk to each other. You have the claims, don't you? Um, but they want you to send them to them. Um, they're not just pulling them from Medicare. They want to see what's happening from your private payers as well, Medicaid as well. So if you have the ability to sort of anonymize that data or you want to know more about this data um, project, um, just contact me and email me. I'll show you my contact information at the end of this presentation. Also, make sure that your documentation justifies, as we've talked about, the appropriateness of the service that was performed. It will defend and the continued use of that modality in the future. If we see Wild West, where people are just doing an audio visit because it was a fallback from a video visit, we're probably going to see audio not be billable and they're going to always default to video visit um, or if we see remote patient monitoring not have enough documentation then we're going to see that that billable service may may be um, uh, far less use used in the in the future and christy anything to add to that i think you know just a key takeaway here as you as you continue to watch regs um, and, and policies is is something that you touched on michelle and that's not just looking at reimbursement, uh, but your state regs. And we used to, you know, we used to joke that the um, the rules are always changing with healthcare, but they really are always changing now. So what was um, true last month may not be true today. And we're seeing quite a few of the boards um, insert or, or develop their own telehealth um, 
regulations for the scope of practice of the, of the discipline. So really be watching that dive into your state so you, you know backwards and forwards what's happening um, at the state level. Um, and again, advocate, especially if you see discrepancies between federal, state, and, and reimbursement policies. We need to start uh, to align all of that. Yep, absolutely. Thank you, Christy. So we've got about 10 minutes left. This is my contact information if you want to know anything about the presentation or the CTEL uh, data, data project that I mentioned. Um, also, Christy's um, uh, email address you can access her at the same phone number. I'll, I'll um, give you her phone number as well. But if you want to speak directly to Christy as well, it's uh, Christy IE, so C H R I S T I E dot Musser, M U S S E R at bluecirrus.com. I should have included that in the slide. I'm sorry. And then follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. We share a lot of information, articles, um, education, et cetera. So please. Um, take advantage of that. We also do a lot of uh, webinars and we do a radio show um, every month and those are all recorded on our website. They're all free. So I'll open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Michelle and Christy. Don't see anything else in the public chat. I would ask you both to check out your chats. Um, a couple of other sessions, people were um, messaging our presenters directly. Um, so just in case, please check those. Um, but our participants, please uh, feel free to ask any questions now. I'll ask Christy a quick question while folks have a chance to add into the chat. Christy, when you think about the, the lift associated with uh, making sure that you're meeting an audit um, and kind of the cost benefit analysis of that. You've got a certain amount of effort associated with making sure you've got, you know, your documentation correct and also convincing people that you need to have your documentation correct and you've got a value associated with that. What do you, what do you think in terms of the lift of the effort and, and against the value? And I'm, I'm kind of thinking about that example that I used in South Carolina where a couple million dollars was taken back. That seems like pretty obvious to have the right that you have the right of effort associated with that but what what are you what is your take on that that is a great thought-provoking question um i think that you know with all new initiatives and this is really we are on the if you want to say cutting edge we're on the razor edge here um uh, of telehealth and i think that any new initiative is going to require upfront investment that seems disproportional to the, um, the value that it may bring. But I, I think that we're gonna have to put in that initial heavier lift up front um, to then eventually realize the value that will come once we have operational um, protocols and workflows and, and things in place. So just think of it as any new new initiative or um, new even a new home, new, new anything, right? You have to put more into it at first uh, to really, um, to really experience and, and realize the value. Yeah, absolutely. There's always a, an upfront cost, um, but in terms of the effort, yeah, that even that South Carolina example I gave, you can you can do an audit and have a couple million dollars taken back, or you can make sure that you you got it right the first time. Yeah, and that, I would I wouldn't shrink away from from um, understanding the compliance, um, especially upfront and and ongoing review. You have to have some resource dedicated to ongoing review. Absolutely. Don't forget that uh, most people are having their telehealth visits being somewhere between 25% to 30% of the total visits. I I'm probably a little high on there, maybe 20, 25%. Um, we, see we see that consistently across the fair health data. We see that consist consistently on all the clients that we're uh, working with as well. So kind of looking at yourself, and see, are you somewhere around 20%? And if you just abandon 20% of your visits and don't worry about getting paid, that's gonna be a heavy cost. So making sure you do it right. Sometimes I describe it like an ER, like you need a lot of people involved with an ER and creating a new emergency room. So um, telehealth is a little bit like that. You need that interdisciplinary approach. 
to be able to make sure that you have a good ongoing program um, in the future that meets the test of, um, of time and the compliance associated with it. I'm so glad that everyone is enjoying it. We're getting lots of great feedback in the chat about the presentation. I'm glad it was informative. Thank you, Christy, for your amazing work on this presentation. Um, I was just the voice box for today, uh, but Christy is, is really the brains behind this and um, really appreciate everyone who attended the presentation today. If you have any questions at all, we are happy to answer them. Uh, that is what we're here for. We're here for the advancement of telehealth and uh, we do that every single day. Thank you. Thank you both Michelle and Christy again, you know, fantastic presentation, very informative. With that being said, we will close out the session a couple minutes early. Uh, please join us this afternoon at 12. We will be honoring this year's rural health champions and telehealth innovators in our region. We're very excited about that, as well as another presentation at two o'clock so again, uh, thank you all for joining this morning and have a wonderful rest of your day.